All right. Welcome to the Leaders Mindset. We're still bringing you illuminating conversations with leaders who are making an impact in business and their communities. If it all looks a little different than what you're used to, we're doing something a little different today. And we are actually at our guest location. They have graciously offered to host us for us. And speaking of our guest today, I'm going to introduce you to nine we're going to have him introduce himself properly in a second. He's in a lot of, involved in a lot of things, and he has some amazing experience. But mostly what we're going to talk about today is his newest passion, North, and what he's learned about leading teams and leadership on his journey all the way back when he started his service in the U.S. Navy and all the steps he took to get here. Thanks for joining us today, Nye. Yeah, hey, thanks for coming over to my spot. I appreciate it. I love it. It's great. I love I love these microphones. I feel like I'm in the boxing ring getting ready to, to, to announce the fighters. So. Uh, in my world, we call that the boxer's corner. The boxer's corner? <laughs> can tell I'm not a fight fan, but uh, I need to, may need to learn a little so, bit more so we'll about talk, it. So we'll talk a little bit about the boxer's corner uh, in a bit. That's a part of what is north. Can't wait. Yep, it'll be cool. Okay, so just to get it out of the way with the audience, because I know they're going to ask, and you know what YouTube comments are going to be like. Okay. What's the deal with the name Nine, and introduce yourself properly. Sure. Please. So uh, my true name is Paul, uh, but I never hear that. Uh, I hear a nickname. Uh, my last name is a K and nine letters. Mm-hmm. It's a Finnish last name. It's somewhat complicated for people to say. Kempinen is how you usually say it. Uh, long ago, Navy a uh, drill instructor says, uh, hey, what are we going to call you? Because they usually call people with gnarly last names Alphabet. Alphabet was already taken. He says, do you realize your last name is a K and nine letters? I said, no, I don't, or I didn't. And he says, you're dumb. You're like a dog. And that's your name from now on. So people started to call me K9. And I think once uh, you get a nickname that starts to stick, mm-hmm. people naturally want to give you a nickname. So uh, Or that or they were lazy and they called me nine. So that's my name. Well, you know, we all get familiar with that. I had a squadron commander in the Air Force who was N plus thirteen. So, nice. so military folks are familiar with the the first, the initial plus the number of letters. So, all right, now that that's out of the way, tell us all about North and what you're trying to achieve with that. Yeah. So, I would say uh, probably by you know uh, history or whatever history's sake or whatever you know my professional discipline, I've been a security professional for decades, uh, and I've. Uh, touched security in almost all capacities, protected people, places, and things, uh, navigated fear and risk at a super high level for a lot of uh, a lot of those things. And these days I have a company that's called North. It's an upstart, and it's ultimately about helping everyday people navigate fear and risk and get after what they want. Yeah, I love it because when we, t- we met through another guest on this show, Mike Andrews, yep. and we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and what really – what I really liked about the conversation we had is you talked multiple times about leaning into fear and risk, helping yes. people lean into fear and risk. And I had never, I never heard it put quite that way before. So how does leaning into fear and risk fit into North? What is, what is it you're trying to help people do with that? How are you trying to help? Them yeah, I, I would say, you know, Hey, what is North? A good way uh, to describe what it is is what it is not. I think uh, a lot of people, North's tagline is to live bold. Uh, and a lot of people that may uh, discover the brand or whatnot would probably be confused that it's uh, what some may call like a brute force strategy to getting after what you want. Maybe the, uh, and no knock against uh, Jocko Willink, but mm-hmm. uh, every day at 420 in the morning, I'm taking a picture and all that. Uh, I think that works for some people, but it's not generally uh, functional and it's not for sure sustainable. Uh, so North is a little bit more of a, a probably a thinking man's or a thinking woman's uh, or a thinking whomever's mm-hmm. uh, approach to getting after what you want. Okay, what very cool. Can so, you la- so lean, oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, leaning into fear and risk is all about this. Uh, it's, it's more just uh, like, say, for example, I don't believe uh, pushing through fear. Uh, that's again, that's not sustainable. It's like leaning into it. It's going to ebb and flow your ability to kind of push against fear, your personal fear. All humans are super fearful, uh, and then it's kind of like acknowledging that, understanding what holds you back, and then leaning into that, and Excellent. then tracking tracking where you're doing that and where you're having success. So it sounds like it's a it's a lifestyle brand. A little bit, yes. Uh, North is somewhat of a lifestyle brand. It will be ultimately, at first, it's a series of workshops uh, that encourage people to take a critical look at how they're operating, uh, see where fear is holding them back, and then separately get super clear about what they want and then get after it. Okay. Are you currently doing the workshops now? Yes. Workshops are offered. Uh, People go online to our site, uh, which I'll provide the, the descriptor later. 
Uh, and then they enroll. And uh, it starts with an intake session where we talk to them a little bit about what they want to do. Uh, and that's me. Uh, so I don't do coaching per se under North, but there is an intake session where we talk to them. Uh, and then we move into like, hey, how fear is holding them back and things like that. And it's not a, as ethereal as you may think. Ultimately, uh, I think we talked or we will talk probably about my security background. Among other things, I was a Secret Service agent. Mm -hmm. You know, So probably the fear exploration starts with how do they teach a Secret Service agent to jump in front of a bullet? And if you get pretty clinical about fear, there's a couple different categories of fear that would hold you back. And that's what we do with individuals is take a look, like a clinical look at that. Yeah, so it's not... It's not uh, purely an academic, purely a theoretical exercise. There's nuts and bolts to this. There's nuts and bolts. So I'm definitely not into, uh, so if you go to North's website and you see what's there, it's definitely not about uh, mystical stuff. I don't believe in ask, believe, and receive. Uh, at least that's not been my personal experience. Uh, life is a little kind of mystical in how it works, uh, and I'm not discounting that. But for sure, I believe in practical skills and tools, uh, especially based on my background. Yeah, I, I would imagine, um, because we're going to go into a little bit of your background, yeah. but, you know, Navy, Secret Service, uh, Intelligence Community, National Park Service, um, you know, you can't, uh, again, not not academic, not theoretical exercises, you're, you're taking care of problems every day. Yeah. So what, what is, without getting too deep into North and giving it away for people, what what is something practical? What's kind of the top level practical stuff you get into with yeah, North? Yeah, so uh, this is a good example. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to take you on a little rabbit ride. Buckle up because we're going to okay. go for a journey. That's why uh, we're here. Some time ago, I oversaw security for the entirety of the National Park Service. Uh, Boston Marathon bombings. They took place, of course, in Boston. And much of the property around where that accident took place is National Park mm -hmm. Service property. Um, it sent ripples and shockwaves not only through Boston, America, and these things, but for sure the National Park Service and its employees. Uh, Gettysburg had its sesquicentennial event, 150th year celebration. Not long after that, and everyone at the park was super terrified uh, that there could be some event like that at Gettysburg. Uh, so I was summoned up to take care of that. And then how did I start? Uh, ultimately, uh, I brought in a whole audience of all the employees. I said, okay, let's talk about scary stuff. And we started to put that like on a whiteboard and then separately with a homework category, right? That if we identify things that we're not already tracking, we're going to go and, and handle those very practically. Um, and then separately, you know, when people do that exercise and they start to talk about what's scary in that, it's all over the map. It's spaghetti, right? It's everywhere. Uh, but it, when, once you do that, you have to have like a, a practical lens to look at that. You look at what's uh, the likelihood of something happen, happening and the consequence. Uh, so like an event, like say, for example, if somebody was reproduced the uh, Boston Marathon bombings at Gettysburg, it was a lower likelihood event, you know. So in your personal life, when you look at all these things that are holding you back, and that's probably a very academic explanation of that, but if you look at what's holding you back, you, you can't just look through this lens of just, man, it's so overwhelming. There's all these different things going on. You have to start to structure it uh, and then peel it back. And there's other things too. Time plays an important component in fear. Like say, for example, if you were going to die tomorrow, right, I don't know kind of like what your day-to-day -day is in the present moment, but if you're going to die tomorrow, you wouldn't be concerned about telling off uh, that person at work that's been driving you nuts, asking this person for a date or whatever the case may be, or a billion other things. So time plays a, a kind of an interesting role in fear too. So we unpack what people are scared of. We put some frameworks and structure around that. We examine things like time and how it factors into fear. Uh, and get people on a trajectory that starts to then look at like what they want to do and get pretty practical about uh, implementing and then separately tracking where fear rears its nasty head. So it sounds like you help people pull apart the spaghetti, turn it into something organized and time phased. So we, in the Air Force, we always when we were looking at a radar scope, we were always looking at not just what's close to us, but what's moving at us quickly, right? And yeah. that's something you help people make sense of what doesn't make sense yeah. when you look at it. So, so there's a great analogy that um, I talked to ChatGPT about the other day. Uh, so ChatGPT ultimately uh, said this, you know, uh, there's a concept of time slowing down. Have you ever had that happen? Oh, yeah. Um, so time slowing down, uh, particularly for military people, you know, if you've had that happen, uh, it's traditionally where you've had a lot of training um, and you've done repetitions and you're very clear about what you want or what the outcome is. Uh, and time tends to slow a bit and you can make better decisions. So if you get super clear about what you want and you're in a stressful situation or fear is there, uh, then ultimately that serves as kind of a pocket compass to help you make like good, critical, quick decisions.
That's great. Yeah, I, I, I've had those experiences, and I think it's great that you're trying to help other people have those experiences to be able to slow that time down, to have the training and the confidence to go in and go, okay, I haven't seen this exactly before, but I've seen something like it and I've prepared for it. And so it's not, it's not racing at you quickly. It's coming at a pace you can handle. Yeah. Love it. Love it so, so much. So what I would say is we've had a, like a lot of kind of discussions about material, but in the end, I'm super committed to like practical skills and tools. Uh, I think, and it's probably in your uh, cards here, but uh, no doubt we'll talk about my time with Elon Musk and he was all about practical. Uh, so like uh, imagine going to Elon as a barometer. He's a good barometer for me. And if I was to tell him I'm going to open a company like North that encourages people to lean into fear and risk, he would ask me practically, what are you doing? Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. Pra- practicality is very important. To and, me. and we will get to Elon. There's no way I was going to let you get out of here without talking about what you learned from Elon. Okay. So uh, any other lessons from your government service that are helping you with what you're trying to achieve today with North? Yeah. So, I mean, North is ultimately uh, packaging up a lot of the different experiences I've had and calling lessons out and then applying them uh, to help people navigate fear and risk is what that is. So uh, that's pulling lessons from uh, just starting in the Navy. I was with the special warfare community, the SEAL program for a little while. I was not a SEAL myself, uh, but I learned a tremendous amount there that's very applicable to, uh, to fear and risk. Uh, just probably as an example, the concept in the SEALs is... Uh, uh, you know, take one step at a time every, you know, one step at a time and kind of keep that that fear and overwhelm at bay um, all the way up to my time uh, with SpaceX. There's some very practical things there uh, that help you push uh, boundaries and go into the unknown. Rocketry is all about taking massive risk. Yeah. And, you know, why don't we just get into that right now? We'll just Let's jump to that question, because when I was in the Air Force, I worked on satellites. I worked on rockets for my first assignment in the Air Force. And so I know how risk averse the government is when it comes to that mission area. I know how risk averse the big contractors, the Boeings of the world, the Lockheed Martins of the world in that. But SpaceX is approaching space from a startup mentality, a um, Move fast and break things may be a little aggressive for what they're trying to do, but they're, they're using a startup mentality of we're going to make mistakes, we're going to learn from our mistakes. In fact, we've even seen that in some of their recent launches over the last few months. So what was, what was it like being part of that mission area, knowing that the customers were really risk averse, but the company was kind of moving faster than the industry was used to? Yeah, I think uh, ultimately in a role like that, and just to be clear at SpaceX, um, I oversaw the physical security program there for many years, and then I moved on to oversee the national security portfolio. So that was liaising a lot with government and then standing between SpaceX and the U.S. government, which was very interesting. You know, like I was the one that communicated exactly what you're talking about. And uh, ultimately that comes to making pe- people feel comfortable. You know, you have to explain that there's some... Uh, logic, some methodology that has been thought through in these kind of things behind what you're doing. Um, obviously, there's fear and risk, so to speak, involved in all of that. And if you set down a practical pathway that's, you know, kind of baked with some good sound thinking around that with some smart minds, it makes sense. Yeah, it it was a it was a really positive influence on the Air Force as well, the space community, the Air Force. Uh, oh, yeah. One of my group commanders did actually two. I had a squadron commander and then a group commander who went and worked for SpaceX as part of their professional military education, a fellowship for a year. Mm. So, and they were both very let's lean forward kind of kind of guys. But that feedback loop did start to occur to come back into senior leadership in the Air Force of if we are smart about taking risks and we are really managing risk, not avoiding risk, we can, we can take chances. Yeah, I think um, it's like probably a quick, detour on the conversation but society for sure has become very risk averse these days like our modern society is not quite as bold or as adventurous as it was in the past north kind of factors into that in some respects but i am pretty encouraged uh by where we are as society right now uh, we're on the cusp of an era filled with just rapid technological change and uh like a choose your own adventure on the horizon to include uh mankind going to places like the moon and mars which once sounded like fiction but it's true and I think, uh, like, the risk appetite and uh, the risk portfolio is changing for sure. Absolutely. I, I would say probably COVID factored into, into that too. I, people really questioned kind of what they were doing and then wanted to push and go in new directions. So, like, the spirit probably of mankind at this point in uh, history is very much about uh, taking off, uh, biting off a little bit more uh, than they could chew, uh, perhaps. I see there being more of an appetite 
yeah. for that. And it's Appetite great for risk. It's great that your North is helping people not just have the appetite, but learn the practical skills to feed themselves yes. in a way that's healthy. Hundred percent. To belabor the analogy a little bit, so so being we're both both military, both prior military. Yeah. I found, and I I was not an outside the wire guy. I, I was not a combat kind of guy, but I did find in those rare situations that we got into when you're when you're in a situation where you're thinking about life and limb, or even just people's safety. We kind of take a little bit different perspective on leadership, on teams. Um, what, what's your perspective on that? What, what did you learn from those kinds of situations, and how has that factored into the leadership decisions you make today? Um, so what I would say, you know, I don't have a prescripted answer for that one, uh, but what I would say is uh, Tony Robbins says an interesting exercise where you identify your primary question in life. Uh, if you think about it and you're still and you kind of like think like, hey, what, what, you know, what is constantly rattling in, in my brain? Uh, mine is what could go wrong. Uh, and it just so happens that I channeled that pretty uh, smartly in my day, uh, being things like a secret service agent. So when it comes to uh, protecting uh, people, places and things and life safety and these kind of things, constantly I think there's a, a important component of that is sitting there very focused on what could go wrong and kind of being ultra committed to that. If you look at the secret service, they look under manholes and all these other things. I think some of that in your, you know, you can't overdo that stuff. You know, you have to, the time, like we talked about before, is an important factor. You identify what risks are there. You get very concrete about what those risks are for life safety and those kind of things. You put in practical steps to solve those, uh, and then you proceed forward with whatever the mission may be. Rocketry is the same way. Uh, you take uh, all the steps that you can to mitigate risk, and at some point you have to launch. Otherwise, you're not learning. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and speaking of what could go wrong, hmm. before North, and in fact, you still have the company, you have a personal protection and security company. Yes. And you, you deal with primarily high-end clients. Uh, so I, uh, with respect, that's my company, SISU, mm -hmm. S-I-S-U. Uh, it's a Finnish term, uh, so like my last name. And it, uh, SISU means uh, steadfast courage and resolve despite overwhelming odds. So uh, I open a small business, which is always tough, but I intentionally put that name because how are you going to call a business uh, sticking to it and that and quit? So uh, Sisu has uh, in its uh, kind of DNA this idea that you lean into just like fear and risk and stuff. I, I um, can't think of a better name for a security company. It protects people, places, and things. So if I look at uh, people, you know, yes, we do protect some higher end clients, uh, entertainers, uh, politicians we've protected. Uh, just like a variety of different people in that respect. Um, I have my favorites. They're not exactly who you would think. Uh, these days, I very much enjoy helping people that are not famous, uh, who are discovering fame, navigate its darker aspects. Uh, so like content creators now that traditionally can't afford uh, heavy security details and stuff like that, helping them navigate some pretty scary stuff. I, I think that's uh, fantastic, yeah. Uh, people, places, and things on the places side, um, I'm supporting a number of technology-related companies in both the uh, uh, energy space and then also uh, in some kind of manufacturing spaces. Uh, and what do I do there? I help them assess what is scary, what is uh, risk worth mitigating and things like that. I help them set out a path to do so. And I also help with like custom workforce training, uh, educating a workforce so they can integrate into helping protect whatever that may be. And things, I protect a couple different uh, things that are passionate and cool to me. In the past, I used to protect, uh, among other things, the gun that shot Abraham Lincoln up to the Statue of Liberty. Uh, these days, mostly like science uh, that you'll see uh, in the coming years uh, unfold. That, that sounds really exciting. And we'll have to have you back when some of those things come out <laughs> so you can tell some stories. Yeah, What sure. I really want to know, um, and you don't have to get any, into any names if you don't want to, but with with the folks that you protect, mm -hmm. you're, you're pretty close to them. What have you learned from them about, I assume some of them are business and influencers and that kind of stuff. What have you learned from them about business and leadership and teams? Yeah, so uh, probably where I'll take uh, that question and answer is uh, I'm about to release a small piece that I call Inside the Bubble. You know, I frequently get questions uh, that ask me what's it like to be around the president or Elon Musk or these kind of people. Um, and, you know, you could probably simplistically describe some things, but the thing that's been the most fascinating to me and I didn't anticipate in protecting people um, is that you are exposed to their very vulnerable side. You're exposed to actually some of these mega celebs 
that are pretty brittle behind the scenes, uh, that they are fearful. You know, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to, uh, like, say, for example, be uh, the press reporting on you negatively or these kind of things and then get out onto stage and sing in these things. Um, and I've surprisingly found myself uh, in a capacity that actually helps push these people forward a bit. So I would say inside the bubble, just like with everyday people, is a tremendous amount of fear and risk. For whatever reason, that has like been a prominent theme in my life that now is starting to, after a number of years addressing that, I said, hey, I should do something about that and create like some kind of a enterprise to tackle that, and that's North. Well, that is that is great. I can't. When is that coming out? That inside the bubble piece. Soon enough. It's Soon art, enough. so it takes its time. I can't. I can't wait because I want to learn from it. Whatever it is, whatever form oh, yeah, it takes, sure. I want to learn from it because I can barely take it when I get a somewhat negative YouTube comment. So, so that's yeah. a that's. I think that's a lesson we all have to learn. At some so, point. so there's a couple different things. You know, I I am like a doctor in that realm, so to speak. Uh, although I'm not a PhD in, mm-hmm. in these kind of things, but what I would say, and I, I talk to people about, we just talked about uh, some negative comments on YouTube and stuff. Um, anytime you kind of step into the public light, uh, two things. If people are not saying negative things about you, they're similarly not saying positive. So that's a very good thing. But the other one is you need to establish your new normal, right? Like the concept that someone is providing negative comments or whatever the case is, that's your new normal. And you get comfortable in that baseline area. And then you look, uh, for me as a security professional now, you look for where that spikes. And that's what should really catch your attention or cause you concern. And oftentimes, hate online is good feedback. You can Elon would encourage that you can make some good changes based on that. That's what I try to tell myself. When I get that negative comment, that means, okay, people are watching this, which is what I want. So, yes. So that's good, and I can't can't wait to see more about in the bubble when it gets in the bubble inside the bubble. inside the bubble when that comes out. By the way, Sisu was awarded named the Vegas Chamber of Commerce 2023 Emerging Business of the Year. So congratulations on yes, that. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So that is a that is exciting. So we talked a little bit about SpaceX, but I want to get into what what you'd like to share. What Elon is a fascinating personality. Yes. Lots of people have lots of feelings about Elon. What did you learn from Elon? Were there any particular lessons you got from him you found that were especially valuable? Yeah. I. Um, so probably couching it up front, I, I will be a bit judicious with how I talk about Elon. As a protector, you know, that's part of my nature too. Um, I would say for sure he's a good word to use is mercurial. You know, he attracts a lot of differing, uh, very passionate Uh, opinions about him Uh, but this is what I would say and I think most humans cannot discount this is that he is one of the brightest human minds that has walked the planet Um, when I think about Elon he reminds me of you know Newton uh, Einstein people that saw things that were you know beyond the horizon Uh, so I would say working with Elon was extremely interesting Uh, extremely empowering. Uh, when I started at SpaceX, ultimately I built the security programs that are there largely from scratch. And that was my charge is how can you make something that's world class? And I was totally empowered to do it. Uh, you know, I like to describe the story as this. He says, what would it take to build a world class security team? Great. I'll come back and uh, I can tell you uh, maybe two days from now. Great. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Uh, I come back tomorrow morning and he said, what would it look like? Well, it looked like these things. It operated a little bit like the Secret Service, the agency, blah, blah, blah. Great. How long would that take to, uh, you know, kind of put together? Oh, maybe about 120 days. Great. You got about 60. Go get at it. Um, so that was a little bit about working for Elon is um, a great degree of empowerment, uh, bold thinking, uh, definitely a f- fixation on world class and these kind of things. And I would say there's a super high expectation that's also important about being around Elon. Uh, Imagine, uh, and you see it, SpaceX has learned how to land rockets, right? Which wasn't always possible. Now imagine if I am working for Elon on the security front and I say I can't figure out some badging system or something like that. It's not an acceptable answer. You know, if other aspects of what Elon is touching can bend science, you should be able to too. Um, So there was for sure a high degree of expectation around how you think, how you perform and all these things. Well, that was a a great answer because that was going to be my next question is when you get when you get those kinds of autonomy, that kind of empowerment from leaders, often there's a very high expectation of uh, 
initiative and uh, accomplishment that comes with that. It's, and it sounds like Mr. Musk, you know, puts all those things together. Yeah. And then the important uh, component is this. You have to imagine if it's a company, right? And I don't know what the employee count is these days. But scale up what I just told you. I was empowered in my specific lane to do these things. And now there are many lanes, HR, finance, uh, production, manufacturing, and all these things. And everyone is kind of encouraged to do these things. It becomes an extremely complex undertaking where people all over the place are kind of pushing boundaries. And the problems you begin to collectively solve with that group are very uh, rich and uh, mind-bending. I bet. Did you... uh... Did you ever feel the pressure with that kind of a uh, challenge in front of you or were you, were you kind of ready for it with your previous experience? I would say, uh, and I think the sentiment is true and holds amongst all the alumni from SpaceX that I still uh, connect with. Uh, that place is unlike anywhere else. Uh, it is uh, for sure. Uh, somebody said, uh, I saw it the other day in a LinkedIn comment, it was a SpaceX employee uh, who was recruiting for uh, Starlink. He said there is no coast phase. A coast phase is where a rocket gets to outer space, mm-hmm. turns off its engines, and just kind of coasts. Uh, there is no coast phase there. You are full-blown in, like, launch uh, every day. Very long days, uh, but very rewarding days uh, at that. Sounds like our, our military days where a lot of expectation, but a lot of yeah, a lot of feeling really good at the end of the day you did something important. 100%. Uh, you see some things that are, you know, again, I use that word mind-bending. That's true. So any other ways your views on leadership and teamwork have changed from starting out as a young man in the Navy all the way through intelligence community, park service, SpaceX, any any other ways you're... Yeah, so this this is an important theme for me with leadership is uh, ultimately I joined the Navy. I was a junior officer. And in the training to become an officer, which is, of course, a leadership position, you're encouraged to look up to leaders above you and glean lessons and... Uh, consume books about leadership and these other things. And uh, for sure in the military, there's a mentorship that you need to kind of drink from. And I did find with time as I kind of grew older and for sure away from the military, um, I found that the leadership uh, out there was not very strong all the time. And with time, uh, it became pretty clear to me and uh, it's incumbent upon yourself uh, to, do, to do that, right? I think uh, some of the, in the formative years in the workplace, wherever the case may be, the military, you discover what your style of leadership is. And then it's incumbent upon you because your style is all your own. You know, you can't go and draw it from other places per se. Uh, it's incumbent upon you to refine that. And how do you do that? Through reps uh, at leading people. I, I love the idea of reps and because I look back and I didn't realize at the time, but even from our early days as young officers, we were getting reps, right? They were giving us opportunities to, to kind of go lead and find our own way, find our own style. And that's something I think the military does, our military does just about be- better than just about anybody else in the world when it comes to leadership is no matter no matter what rank you're coming in at from the moment you come in, we start giving you those reps. Yeah, I would say uh, fear and risk, which are prominent themes. And I'm not saying that just to reiterate back to, to North because this is very much like who I am. Uh, plays a prominent role in my leadership style too. Uh, humans are naturally fearful and oftentimes don't uh, you know, believe they can accomplish this, that, or the other thing. And uh, a part of me is encouraging people to push beyond that. Oh. I, I think if you're, you're a leader that empowers people to take risk, it's hyper-effective. And Elon is that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's something that, looking back at my time in the Air Force, when they, when they encouraged us to take managed risk, we would get, you know, sometimes we would get really good payoffs and sometimes we would learn a really big lesson. Yeah. But those were valuable lessons for us as leaders. So, and and don't feel bad. We're here to talk about North and that idea of leaning oh, into fear yeah. and risk. So, so bring it up as much as you want. So when you and I first talked, you brought up something that I thought was really, really compelling, a really compelling idea I haven't heard anyone bring up before. And you said we're moving from the information age into the intelligence age. Can you elaborate a little more on that and what, what, what makes you think that and what that means for all of us? Yeah, uh, so I have told you and I tell other people too that we are moving from the information age into the intelligence age. Information is just like saturated with you know, text messages, uh, emails, uh, 
information that you can consume, etc. It's becoming a world that is the volume knob is turned up till 10 or more. 11, and, right? Yeah, 11, 12, uh, whatever, whatever the case may be. Uh, but the intelligence age is where you start to sift through that and then start to harness information to do great things. And I'm uh, not just jumping on the bandwagon with AI. I'm super fascinated by that capability. It's super clear that it can help you see through a lot of noise and help you grab disparate information and do some pretty amazing things. It comes with a tremendous amount of risk, uh, but the benefits are are super promising. Yeah, I agree. A- AI, uh, this is my personal opinion, take it for what it's worth. AI is going to be the kind of technological change. It's not going to be like the internet kind of technology change. It's not going to be like splitting the atom kind of technology change. It's going to be like printing press technology change. It's going to be completely changing the way the whole world does everything. I uh, 100% agree with you. I think we're one or two iterations away with some of the predominant uh, large language models and other uh, tech that will really fundamentally change how we are operating. And uh, I did, uh, I, I use uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI's uh, large language model quite a bit to explore every, ideas every day and for stuff. Me. And uh, uh, it's, it's, you're talking about it as if it's a person, like meaning me. Uh, but I had an interesting conversation literally with it this morning. And uh, it occurred to me that AI will uh, ultimately just magnify who you are as a person. I think if you're a person that is not cool, doing bad things and those kind of things, it will kind of supplement your efforts in those areas. But if you're a good person trying to do good things and uh, a creative person or whatever, it will augment or supplement those things. I think AI will ultimately help humans be more of what they presently are. And then hopefully, like in some respect, which I cannot see, will filter out some of the human uh, not-so-good parts. Well, it sounds like AI might be just like money or fame. It's just going to be an amplifier for what you already are as a person. So, you know, I want to go back to the idea. I didn't plan on getting into this, but with the idea of leaning into fear and risk, because there is a lot of fear around AI, there's certainly a lot of risk. Yes. What, what is your advice for all of us as we alternate, whether, whether we embrace AI or, you know, how, how we approach AI advice on leaning into fear and risk with AI? Um, so this is what I would say. Uh, interestingly, I have a 14-year-old daughter, and she does not like the concept of AI. And I would figure you know, children would be very opposed or like into it. Kids, what are you going to do? Uh, but my daughter uh, kind of gravitates this, towards this idea that a lot of jobs will be lost and to include you know, things that she may want to do. Um, and this is kind of, you know, as a father, you're forced to answer that kind of question. It's a difficult one. And the truth of the matter, the cold, hard truth without sugarcoating is like Pandora's box is open, I like to say, and there's no turning back. So the idea is you have two options or three. You bury your head in the sand, kind of maybe tacitly be aware of it or lean into what's unfolding. Um, and I think, you know, twofold. Number one, there's advantages to come from leaning into what AI is. And uh, something about being human is very much leaning into fear and risk. And I, AI can't lean into fear and risk, but humans can. Yeah, and I, I'm encouraged because we are having the conversation about pros and cons of AI, unlike some other technologies that have come along in the last couple of decades. We're having that conversation. And I, I'm i an optimist. I think AI is going to help us find what's more human about all of us. Yeah, so. I think so. And one thing I would say that does concern me, it's not that I'm fear. Well, perhaps I am fearful of it. Uh, I've noted just kind of in watching AI develop and unfold, uh, there's not a lot of classic security professionals involved in those discussions. Uh, It's largely preeminently software designers, engineers, and these things that are leading the charge without probably a classic security component in there. And that's not great. Uh, That suggests two different things, which is uh, like I philosophically believe in the security world, we're on the cusp of some change there too. I don't believe that the security industry is kind of prime for what's over the horizon. It operates in a probably 1980, 1990s fashion. It's one of the last industries that uh, is still not been disrupted. I mean, I'm tired of taking off my shoes in the airport and surrendering my bottle of water, aren't you? Uh, Absolutely. I've been tired of that for 20 years (laughs) now. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, um, you know, I came up through special programs in the Air Force. And, um, yeah, things... 
I got out in 2015. I actually stopped working special programs in 2012, but things were still kind of running in 2012 the way they were running in 1999. Yeah. So, so uh, it's a it's an industry ripe for disruption, and you know yeah. maybe you can help with that. Well, so what I would say is uh, disruption. Uh, some people, I think that was a term that was in vogue a couple of years ago. I'm not really about disruption. I think these days probably what's a more practical pursuit for people. It's much more like what you saw with Elon and SpaceX and NASA. He didn't try to disrupt NASA. He just fundamentally tried to uh, solve some problems and focused on that. And I think that's probably a great example and a great uh, inspiration for people. Excellent. So you obviously have a really great relationship with ChatGPT. What are some of the other tech tools you use to manage your companies, work with your team, that kind of thing? Yeah, so a lot of classic tools, you know, nothing that probably blows your mind. I use uh, things like Atlassian's Trello quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, I definitely use, you know, probably simplistically Notion to capture uh, thoughts and things like that. Uh, A classic suite of Office tools, but more so on Mac, meaning Keynote and Pages and these kind of things. And then a great amount of multimedia tools. I use just because I have a passion in that. So what is that? Final Cut Pro, Photoshop, and these kind of things. Excellent. And what are the non-tech tools or processes you use to, to manage your teams and keep your keep your keep all your initiatives that you have going? Yeah, going? and that falls into North too is uh, for sure I'm a big believer in you have to have a map, so to speak, uh, that can be you know copied down digitally. It can be on paper or whatever the case may be. Um, that just charts out where you're trying to go, right? And a good pocket compass that ultimately helps you make decisions, right? That, uh, you know, hey, these things are important to me. When I make a decision, uh, it should factor in my family, uh, you know, like this pursuit at work that I want to do or whatever my passions are. Uh, So I'm a big believer in that. And then managing a company that way too. A good, like, map and compass, so to speak. Cool. So way back at the beginning of this conversation, you talked about how do we train people to jump in front of that bullet? Business, especially on the government side, the contract, the government contractor side, but in general, a lot of business folks, a lot of civil, civilian leaders, leaders in the civilian world, I want to say, are taught to at best manage risk and kind of more, especially the last 20 years or so, are taught to avoid risk. Mm-hmm. But if we really want to achieve things that were worthwhile, that are worthwhile, sometimes we need to jump in front of that bullet. So what's your advice for leaders to help their young leaders that they're trying to develop break those habits and patterns of trying to avoid risk and lean into fear and risk. So I believe that a core component of leaning into fear and risk is meaning, right? Why would a Marine run towards danger? Like a ridiculous amount of meaning. Why would classic aerospace companies that are known to be risk averse lean into it like crazy when we went to the moon? Meaning, like ultimately meaning if you as a CEO or leader can instill rich meaning in what you're doing, that's like the catalyst that will help people push through fear and risk for sure. And what I would say conversely, you know, uh, this is somewhat related to that topic in space, of course, I'm very fascinated by all of that. If you look at the Apollo astronauts when they came back, you know, and if you go back and do the research, a lot of them really struggled. They didn't do well with putting on the necktie, taking off the astronaut suit, and sitting in the cubicle. Um, And a lot of them had problems with alcoholism and things like that. Why? Because it lost meaning. Yeah, I imagine uh, just like after you're done being president of the United States, you know, what more hills are there to climb, right? Yeah. You got to go find meaning in your life somehow. Yeah, 100%. I would say, you know... You know, for sure, George W. Bush is an interesting example of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very inspiring to see what he's doing with painting uh, these days and all that. So, yeah, uh, I'm, it, that's an interesting kind of rabbit hole I could for sure run down because I, I think it's uh, pretty intriguing. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the fact that he picked up painting because, you know, a lot of presidents will go, they'll start a foundation, they'll do that kind of thing. A lot of charitable work, a lot of philanthropy, a lot of, you know, trying to do outside the government, the things they were trying to do inside the government. But George W. Bush took up painting, which I really respect. And I think, yeah. that, I think it's cool. So uh, personal opinion on that. Uh, I had kind of an aha moment. Uh, I was protecting George W. Bush. Uh, I, I was in the Secret Service in those days. And I went to his ranch in Crawford. And uh, I was near his uh, private library that was there. And it dawned on me just like, 
right there for whatever reason that there was no escaping for him what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan and kind of this stream of U.S. soldiers getting, you know, injured or killed and these kind of things. It was just like uh, that was pretty profound. But what I would say is when I see him doing the painting and things these days, it's healing some of what I saw then is my personal opinion. Uh, Interesting character. Yeah. uh, Looking forward to seeing what's coming from from more of that. From W. From W, yeah. Um, So – some of the ideas you have about leaning into fear and risk, they come from growing up with your dad and your relationship with your dad, especially as he he got on in years. Can you yes. can you tell me more about how that started? And Yeah, I'll tell you two things. Uh, so the first one I talk about a lot. The second one I've really not talked about publicly before, but I'm cool doing that. Uh, in the first respect, uh, when you're a child, you tend to re- repel against whatever your parents instill in you, right? Uh, they may tell you, you know, hey, don't don't wear, uh, you know, don't wear that that clothing that exposes uh, you or whatever the case may be, and you're like, I'm going to wear it anyway. Uh, my dad was ultimately just a very fearful person uh, and encouraged uh, myself and my brothers not to take a lot of risk, and by default, I you know kind of repelled against that a bit, and uh, I became very much about taking you know, some risk in my life. Uh, I would say that over time, a decade's worth of, you know, military, secret service, central intelligence, SpaceX, all these things. My dad originally was not a proponent of any of those things. He actually encouraged me not to join the military and things like that. Um, he, I, I asked him once in kind of a frustrated way, I said, what would you have me do? Would you have me work in like a library? Is that what you want? Um, uh, and, but long story short, with time with my dad, he became comfortable in the idea that I, I guess you're, you're, you're figuring it out uh, and stuff like that. Um, and I wouldn't say my dad was a completely fearful character, but he passed away a couple years ago. And uh, I said goodbye to him before he you know, expired. Well, that was probably a more technical term for that. Uh, but I said goodbye to him and... Uh, he had Alzheimer's, so it was like a brutal end for him. It took a tremendous amount of courage to navigate that, so Absolutely. kudos to him. But I remember uh, he was lying in the bed, uh, you know, right there towards the end, a day or so away from passing away, and I came to see him, and uh, I he kind of op- opened his eyes in these things, and uh, he grabbed my hand, and I had tears dripping down my face onto my dad's face, And he just, you know, he grabbed me super tight with his hand. And, uh, you know, I told him everything was okay. And, you know, I gave him that jolt, like I told you, that I've, for whatever reason in life, have kind of been in a space where, you know, I've been called upon to do that many times. Um, But at the same time that my father passed away, I thought to myself, and this is the part I haven't really shared very much, is I will not live or so much like I will not go out like this. I will not go out like you. I will push myself into fear and risk all the more, do what my heart tells me to do and things like that. And just like, so I can go away, you know, like walk off this earth knowing that I really put it all on the field. And not only are you doing that for yourself, you're doing that for lots of people through North. Yeah. I mean, so just uh, imagine, put yourself in my shoes for a second. If, uh, and, and of course you do uh, positive impact and things like that too. But uh, for me, this is ultra rich, the idea that I could help people lean into fear and risk and get after what they want. Ultra meaningful for me. How, uh, could, it, how could it not be? Yeah, and it's really, uh, as I look back in time, and I didn't really kind of know I was on a path to do what I'm doing, it intuitively makes sense. Has it helped you as a parent? Uh <laughs> So anytime you get these practical skills and then you try to apply them to parenthood, uh, that is a kind of a laboratory in and of itself. You know, uh, I would say probably candidly, uh, I've definitely been a father that's encouraged my daughter to you know, be bold and these kind of things. But my daughter is, uh, you know, finding her own way. And uh, what I would say is I'm very uh, supportive and passionate about that. Uh, and then this is an important part about North too. Again, back to what we started. I'm not a big believer in brute forcing, getting after what you want. I don't think that's sustainable. I think you have to have compassion for yourself and your ability to lean into fear and risk. That will change every day. 
Uh, but I think the most important component is you just don't settle, keep moving, and really chase after what you want. So we've talked quite a bit about the meaning behind North. Yes. But let's get into a little more nuts and bolts. What's coming up for North in 2024? What are your goals? How are you going to get there? What kind of help do you need? Who are you looking to bring on? Yeah, so I think the uh, North is a startup, right? So uh, what's interesting is I've owned Sisu, a security company, for a number of years now and had a lot of success with it. But people have come out of the woodwork to ask me about North. People that I've known from industry and all these things, there's a lot of interest around North. But I think also with where it's at in its present, uh, you know, kind of uh, which its life cycle of a business, um, it has some explaining to do. Uh, we've doing, been doing some of that today. Uh, but I ultimately think when people perceive a brand like North, they view it as some raw, raw uh, exercise to get after what they want or something like that. And that is not the case. So in 2024, North in its upstart mode has a lot of probably evangelizing to do around what it is. Some of that uh, comes from me also explaining uh, my journey is very much stitched into North, uh, you know, kind of what that's all about and getting people to know, like, and trust uh, you and believe in your ability to help them. Um, so there's other things too. Uh, it's workshop series will go. I talked about the Boxer's Corner, right? Um, so ultimately, North offers a series of workshops. If you've been through those and you're using the practical skills and tools to lean into fear and risk, there's a community that goes along with that called the Boxer's Corner. You can imagine by the descriptor what that is. It's a group that's been through similar style framework and then now is supporting each other and getting after what they want. Um, sometimes I may be in the boxer's corner. You know, it's not like I'm impervious or immune to fear and risk or uh, life landing wicked shots or these kind of things. Uh, so very much look forward to growing uh, audience uh, or not audience, but enrollees in the workshop series and then to continue to build the boxer's corner. Boxer's Corner uh, will in some time have some retreats that are not only virtual, but also physical, probably adventurous retreats um, to connect with uh, people in person and then push forward. Uh, and then probably uh, lastly, uh, with the North, and I'm very much looking forward to it. North has a component of it that's about messaging that I talked about. I'm headed to the beaches of Normandy in the fall. Uh, so where D-Day took place. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that will be very uh fulfilling to do some content in a place like that uh, because the people that stormed that beach were all about courage. Uh, like I, there was a mix, I'm sure. Uh, but in hindsight, what took place that day uh, was very courageous. Yeah. Talk about doing something with meaning, right? Yeah. I, it's a, uh, you know, they call that generation the greatest generation. I don't know that to be completely true. I'm not ready to close the book on the rest <laughs> of us, uh, but it was pretty damn remarkable. That's for sure. Well, we are we are honored you're letting us have this conversation with you today, and we are honored to help you with your messaging for North over yeah, the coming year. It. Please let us know how we can do more of that in the future for you. Yeah. So when you are looking to hire someone, especially if you're looking to hire them in a leadership position, what are you looking for from them? What, whether it's traits, experience, what what are you looking for when you – look to bring someone in to be a leader in your organization. Yeah, I, I'll say two two things. One is probably my lens, and the second, probably because it would be interesting, is what Elon would think. Uh, the first for me is I'm very much a believer in multidisciplinary experience. Uh, let's step back. I own a security company. Uh, in security, there's only so many things in the toolkit, a military solution, intelligence, you know, security technology, these kind of things. Uh, law enforcement, maybe if I hire someone, they better have experience in multiple areas. Uh, you know, they say that, uh, you know, experience comes from making mistakes. If you don't have a lot of experience, you're going to make some mistakes. So I'm not into that. On the Elon side, uh, interestingly, and I don't know how much he still adheres to this today, uh, but he was a big proponent of asking uh, interviewees, what, tell me about the most complicated problem you've solved. Because if uh, someone can't answer that question, it's it's pretty clear. Like if you don't have an answer that you can kind of, oh, yeah, hey, I remember I saw this crazy thing. You don't have that. It's not something that you can fake. Uh, and by way of solving, a con you know, explaining how you solve the complex problem, you're explaining how you think. You're explaining your experience, your, you know, your approach to solving problems, all that. What a fantastic interview question. I'm going to add that to my list. Yeah, you should. I'm going to because that is a that is a fantastic one. So 
when we bring people on to be leaders in our organization, what, whatever role it is we bring them on for, whatever amount of experience they have, they're usually not 100% fully formed of where we want them to be. What do you do to develop the leaders in your organization? So I'm a big believer. Um, and then North doesn't have a lot of people on board yet. It's still very much a startup mode. It's very much a passion, project, personal mission, and these kind of things. Uh, it will in time grow and scale. Uh, but with respect to the security company, which is a much better lens to explore, I'm a huge proponent of selectively hiring, uh, properly training, and effectively equipping people to get in the mix, uh, be it uh, a junior entry uh, type person or a leader too, uh, is those things. And for sure, uh, explaining a lot about what the mission is, the meaning, we talked about that earlier, uh, that's critical. Uh, you could probably take a lot of the hard skills in security and throw them out the window, take in security staff, spend two to three days talking with them about the meaning of what you're up to. And you'd have an explosive workforce. Yeah, I think that's so important. When I do new manager training with companies, one of the first, the first hour we spend on the meaning of being a leader, the meaning of being a manager, and the meaning of being part of this organization. Yeah. And it's, it's, and we only spend an hour on it. We probably could spend two to two or three days on it, but I think it's such an important thing to, that not only to say up front, to continue to say every day. Yeah. I, so a uh, important component on that too, uh, just a quick vignette on that, right? Uh, in my security company, we're very much focused on customer service, right? So when we do our standups or our group meetings and stuff like that, there's an intentionality around where did you exceed a client's expectations? Uh, tell me about like a magical moment that you created for a client. I think that's critical. It doesn't just start at jump where you explain all this meaning and all that. It's you constantly revisit that with your team. Awesome. And Love cultivate it. leadership and many other things. Love it. What was the best mistake you've ever made and what did you learn from it? Yeah, best mistake I ever made. Uh, so this is a, a little bit longer story. Uh, but I'm going to try to condense it. I talked about being in the military. I talked about being in the special warfare community with the SEAL teams and whatnot. And uh, I talked about the idea very explicitly that I was not a SEAL. And that's because I went through SEAL training, uh, but when I was in there, I quit. Uh, so for sure, imagine spending years training to become a Navy SEAL and you quit. That was pretty rattling or jarring for me. Here's an interesting one that ties back to the storyline that we talked about previously, I won't reveal it, but guess when I was going through SEAL training, which they call BUDS, when I called someone, like when I called home, mm -hmm. guess what Guess what I was told? You know, I'm looking for support because yep. SEAL training is tough in these things. Guess what the voice on the other line, which was my dad said? You gotta stick with it. He said, you should quit. Oh, he did? Yes, because he's a very fearful critter. Um, and I will say that my dad's voice rattled around in my head and there was a variety of other reasons too. Um, I saw a lot of friends leave training and things like that, but ultimately that was, could be construed as a mistake, uh, the leaving the seal program. Uh, but what I would say is that fast forward in, in, uh, many years into the future and I'll be try to be as, as quick as I can about this story. Uh, very disorienting time after I left the SEAL program. What am I going to do? Like, how can I find a life of adventure? Because I thought the SEALs were everything. Uh, I realized because I go to the ATM and check out how much cash I have, I don't make a, like any money in the military as a junior officer. I'm, what? And I bought like a car like most military this, people do. This was the 90s, right? Yeah. I, I remember when and, I made my first full year on active duty and it, it, it wasn't like, a lot. You're like, it's not a lot. So I go to the library and I get a book called uh, Into Thin Air. By John Krakauer. It's about this 1996 climbing disaster on Mount Everest. I was literally sleeping about 20 hours a day, depressed for sure. And uh, I started reading that book and I read that book for two days straight. I didn't like go to sleep. It was so riveting. And Mount Everest taught me that there was for sure adventure to be had out there. I borrow a friend of mine's uh, CDs. He was trying to get me to listen to Tony Robbins CDs. Before I went to SEAL training, I was like, I want nothing to do with these things. But I didn't have any cash. I didn't have anything to do. So I said, why not? Just give me these things. Uh, and I start, you know, kind of getting, he has practical skills and tools to kind of get clear about what you want and get after it. Um, so fast forward many years, you know, in the mistake part and all of that stuff, oftentimes in mistake comes some interesting things. Fast forward many years, I've now... In, under my own power, protected Tony Robbins, which I wouldn't have imagined in those days. I've been to Mount Everest myself, which I wouldn't have imagined in those days. And then lastly, 
Um, I've recently started talking to the SEAL teams about talking to people who uh, don't make it through training. I, I think that'd be fantastic to go tell your story to the folks who were in, who are in the position you were in all those years ago. I think that'd be yeah. fantastic. So, so North is headed on an upward trajectory. It looks like it's headed towards a lot of success. You've had a lot of success with the other companies, the other ventures you've been involved in, but not everything is all an upward trajectory no. and success. What are the things that keep you up at night? What are the things, what are the real challenges you think you're going to face and how are you going to deal with them? Yeah. So I would say that uh, the entrepreneur space in general is a very, uh, it is, I, I've used the analogy that some have likely heard me say, it's a little bit like walking through the desert with just the light of a small lamp at night, kind of showing you the way at best you can see a couple feet ahead or behind. So one of the things that's pretty unnerving about a small business is just, it's a, uh, you wake up every day without the best clarity as to what opportunities will break and stuff like that. Uh, that becomes very, at times, disheartening, frustrating, and these kind of things. And you have to lean into fear and risk to navigate that terrain. Very cool. Um, so to lean into that, to navigate that terrain, how do you stay calm and centered? Uh, part of that is like my Finnish upbringing, right? Finnish, are, Finnish people are uh, known to be pretty stoic. Very, uh, very even kind of keeled. Yep. But I would say I uh, for sure have a lot of training uh, that has been uh, you know, very dramatic. I have a lot of real world experience uh, now. Uh, it's probably just I mentioned I worked uh, aspects of the Boston Marathon bombings. Uh, I've worked uh, down commercial airlines. I've uh, I've worked fatalities. Uh, you know, a lot of things that lead to. Uh, uh, we used this descriptor earlier too, which is you have to get this new normal. So I would say my new normal or my threshold for, uh, you know, probably freaking out is pretty high. So if your threshold for freaking out is pretty high, what are some things that don't get you freaked out, but get you excited? What are you excited about coming up here? Um, so for sure, I'm excited about, I mean, the concept of North and getting people in that ecosystem is ultra compelling to me. Uh, that is probably if I could walk away from the planet, having pulled off uh, something like North, that would be worth it. Uh, so that's super exciting to me. It in turn, my kind of excitement doesn't manifest like bouncy and giddy like many people would. Uh, it's more uh, invest into an expenditure of energy uh, is, is how it manifests. So if I'm excited about something, you'll see me constantly working with it, tinkering with it talking about it and things like that. And North is one of those things. Yeah, it's exciting. I can't, I can't wait to learn more. Be part yeah. of North. I can't, I think our audience probably can't wait to learn more and be part of North as it gets really gets going this year. Someone or something you're grateful for? Um, so I'm certainly grateful for uh, you know, like many different people. Uh, you know, it's, this is one of those questions where you're just like, man, I can't just identify one. But for sure, I'd have to put my wife in the mix. Uh, as far as just the, uh, you know, belief she's had in me, we've taken a lot of twisty turns to arrive at where I am. Uh, although it sounds very, maybe fairy tale, all these different wickets I've touched, there was a tremendous amount of risk involved in making all those moves. In the early days, we did things like, uh, sell my wife's name is uh, Tiffany. We call her Tiff. We sold Tiff's wedding ring to just simply exist. You know, the government doesn't pay a lot downsized like crazy. I took massive pay cuts. Uh, a good example of that, I was a Secret Service agent before I went to the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, I've made about maybe 160, 170 grand a year. I took a pay cut all the way down to 60 grand to go to the Central Intelligence Agency. So you have to imagine my wife in her side of the Jeep uh, with her seatbelt on. She's been very uh, understanding, uh, kind, considerate, is supportive in these things. Uh, so I'm super appreciative of that. My, and that extends out daughter, mother, like my dad, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many. It, it sounds like they've been there for you every step of the way and are really behind what you're doing. I, I assume they're behind what you're doing with North. Yeah. I mean, in, in the end, I think back to leadership as a topic, right? Uh, people put their trust in you and it's on you to deliver. Uh, and I think humans uh, in general don't expect you to always win because they know that's how life works, but they expect you to try damn hard. Right. And I would say that the circle of family and friends that I have 
you know, I feel supported and all those things, but they're, they're, they're in the background expecting me to try damn hard. That's a, that's incredible. I think that's, I think that's a fa- fantastic advice for everybody. And speaking of advice, this is our last real question here. Mm-hmm. Uh, advice you would give to young leaders, future leaders, aspiring leaders, especially about leaning into fear and risk. Yeah, I, I would for sure. I mean, you kind of uh, short-circuited my, my answer, but I definitely am all about taking bold risk. Uh, I'll probably go back and uh, use this, a short story to highlight what I mean. Uh, life has a strange way of when you, uh, and this is sounding very kind of preachy about North, and I don't mean it to be. Life has a very funny way, although I said not the mystical component too earlier on, has a very funny way of rewarding you when you take unthinkable risk. Uh, I'm at the National Park Service. Uh, this is probably the 2013 time frame. And, you know, I've had this kind of security career that is pretty amazing. And uh, my dad and I have a conversation. He's involved in that. I told him, I said, uh, because his actually time with him as a you know, you know young kid uh, influenced me to go down the security track watching a lot of James Bond films. But he says, what are you going to do now? I said, well, I think I'm going to be an astronaut. And my dad says, at this point, he's comfortable with me taking risk. He says, uh, well, you do what you want. And, uh, of course, I don't have a STEM degree, uh, you know, science, technology, etc. Uh, so I'm not a great candidate for that. So I don't apply by USA Jobs, right, which is the traditional means of doing so. I would get insta rejected. I couldn't even make it through the portal. So instead, I look at the job advisement. I track down in size four micro font where the recruiting office is. I send a personal letter with photos and all these other things, a compelling uh, begging letter, let's say. I track down the lead astronaut recruiter and I harass her for a couple of weeks. I'll use that word harass because that's <laughs> what I was doing. And uh, ultimately, they were super cool. And NASA sent me a rejection letter on old school letterhead, which they won't do. If you apply through USA Jobs, I took some unthinkable risk, tried to be an astronaut. Of course, I didn't really think I had a chance at it. But a couple weeks after that, a friend of mine says, why don't you check out this company? It's called SpaceX in Los Angeles, California. It's owned by this guy, Elon Musk. Um, I said, I will. I wind up interviewing for a position where they need somebody to build out their security program from scratch. And the question I get is this. Everything about the security side and what you're talking about there makes sense but why do you want to work at a space company? And I pull out that rejection letter and put it right there, and I was hired pretty much on the spot. So what I would say to any aspiring human being, let alone a leader or whatever the case may be, is in life, it will surprise you if you take unthinkable risk. At least that's been my experience. Well, you heard it here. So, all right. What else should we know about you? And what else should we know about North or anything else you want to tell us about? Yeah, I probably the last for me is uh, my company. And you could quite simply Google uh, these things. It'd probably be the easiest to do. Uh, Sisu, S-I-S-U, is my protection company in Las Vegas. Uh, So if somebody is uh, traditionally the, the clients that we work with the most are people that are really legitimately scared or need help navigating some complex problems, uh, we help them out. And then North, uh, ultimately just Google like North and live bold and you will find us. We will, we will put all that in the show notes so you guys don't have to Google it. You'll have it right at your yeah, fingertips. Yeah, so that's the case. And I would just say uh, definitely, you know, we've talked a lot about my passion areas and my background, but I, I don't think those are the probably funnest or coolest aspects of who I am as a human being. I would say if uh, whomever may see or hear this, if you see me in public, come on up. Let's have a chat about many different things Uh beyond just the realm of security or leaning into fear and risk. I, I can vouch for that. We've had a couple of good conversations so far, so I'm excited to have more in the future. Yeah. Thank you for talking with us today. Yeah. Thank right. you for hosting us today. This was a lot of fun to come to your place and do this. Thank you all for watching. If you like Nine, if you like what he's doing with North, be sure to reach out and thank him for being on the show for us today. If you like these interviews, Please like, comment, share, subscribe, tell a friend. We love doing them for you. Whatever you're going to go off and do today, make sure you do it with impact. And lean Um, into fear and risk. Lean into fear and risk. Onward and upward.